Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. The book I'm interpreting for you today is The Making of the Atomic Bomb by American author Richard Rhodes. This is an extensive work that tells the story of the birth of the first atomic bomb in human history. Throughout the book, you'll encounter terms like nuclear fission and chain reaction, which are complex physics terminology, making the reading seem quite challenging. However, it's a highly popular bestseller. Since its initial publication in 1986, the making of the atomic bomb has been translated into over a dozen languages, selling over 200,000 copies in the United States alone. It has also received prestigious awards, including the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. In 2005, the U.S. magazine Fortune listed it among the 75 books smart people should read to understand business, showcasing its relevance beyond its scientific content. But why would the editors of Fortune magazine recommend studying the making of the atomic bomb to understand business? Before addressing this question, let me ask you one first. Do you know the principle behind the creation of an atomic bomb? When you hear this question, you might immediately think of Einstein. During his research on the theory of relativity, Einstein introduced the famous equation E equals mc squared, where he represents energy, m is the rest mass of an object and C is the speed of light. According to this equation, if the nucleus of an atom, the fundamental building block of all matter, undergoes fission, releasing a small amount of mass, it can unleash an incredibly vast amount of energy. Inspired by this equation, European scientists in the 1930s discovered that uranium, a radioactive element, could undergo controlled nuclear fission with human intervention, releasing immense energy. The first atomic bomb developed by the United States in 1945 utilized uranium metal as its explosive core. However, take note, Einstein's identity was that of a theoretical physicist. He neither directly researched nuclear fission nor studied uranium. After the detonation of the first atomic bomb, Einstein remarked, I do not consider myself the father of the release of atomic energy. My part in it was quite indirect. This perspective underscores that knowing the principle of E equals mc squared and actually creating the end product, the atomic bomb, were worlds apart. This book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb, delves into this vast divide. Through a comprehensive historical review, it informs us that the development of the atomic bomb progressed through two phases. The first is termed intellectual management which involved connecting dispersed nuclear physics knowledge and top-tier scientists from various disciplines through interpersonal networks to collaborate on bomb development. The second phase is engineering management, which concentrated manpower, resources, and finances from different industrial sectors into the atomic bomb project to strive for the final product. The insights from managing these two phases have significant relevance to our daily work, especially in business and research projects. For instance, the concept of systems engineering, often heard of, directly relates to the engineering management during the atomic bomb development process. The author of The Making of the Atomic Bomb, Richard Rhodes, graduated from Yale University and is a historical researcher well-versed in nuclear physics. The Los Alamos National Laboratory, a U.S. facility dedicated to nuclear weapon development, requires all new employees to study an introductory handbook written by Rhodes. To craft the making of the atomic bomb, Rhodes interviewed more than 10 Nobel laureates in physics and chemistry, including five individuals involved in the development of the atomic bomb. In his narrative, giants of physics like Einstein, Szilard, and Bohr are portrayed vividly, devoid of the dryness often associated with academic works. Nobel laureate in physics in 1959, Emilio Segre, who was a member of the U.S. Atomic Bomb Project, once remarked, if you want to read a book about the birth of the atomic bomb, then Rhodes' The Making of the Atomic Bomb would be the best choice. If you wish to glean insights into management from the story of the atomic bomb, this book is even more indispensable. Next, I will divide the presentation into three parts to introduce the main content of the book to you. First, let's delve into how intellectual management and engineering management were executed in the development of the atomic bomb in the United States highlighting key figures involved. In the second part, I will compare the U.S. atomic bomb project during World War II with similar projects in Germany and Japan, 
elucidating why only the United States successfully implemented effective intellectual and engineering management. Finally, I will summarize the management lessons derived from the birth of the atomic bomb and how they can provide valuable insights for our everyday work. Part 1. When mentioning the U.S. atomic bomb project during World War II, you might have heard of its codename, the Manhattan Project, officially initiated in 1942. However, according to the author Rhodes, the story of the atomic bomb should actually start in 1933. In that year, two significant events occurred in Germany. Hitler became chancellor and commenced the ruthless persecution of Jewish intellectuals, while a scientist named Leo Szilard, a German-Jewish physicist, conceived the basic concept of the atomic bomb for the first time. Leo Szilard, the physicist, wasn't as renowned as Einstein. He never won a Nobel Prize in physics and had a rather unconventional personality. Nonetheless, in the realm of nuclear physics during the 1930s, Szilard played a pivotal role. After immigrating from Hungary to Germany following World War I, he quickly became an academic partner of Einstein, collaborating on several papers. When Hitler rose to power, Szilard was teaching at the University of Berlin. He keenly sensed the Nazi party's animosity towards Jews and decided to move to England early, persuading his old friend Einstein to remain in the United States, his current place of academic visit, and not return to Germany. This astute decision preserved a star in the history of science and set the stage for the story of the first atomic bomb. In 1933, when Szilard moved to England, Einstein's equation for mass-energy equivalence, E equals mc squared, was already well known throughout the scientific community. However, the precise mechanism for inducing nuclear fission within atomic nuclei and the selection of which atomic nuclei to use in experiments had not yet been determined. At this juncture, Szilard came across a news article in the Times reporting the discovery of a new elementary particle by British scientists, the neutron. Szilard realized that by bombarding atomic nuclei with neutrons as bullets, nuclear fission could be triggered. The nuclei would split, releasing new neutrons from within. Szilard immediately grasped that these newly appearing neutrons would not vanish into thin air. They would continue to collide with neighboring atomic nuclei, perpetuating the fission process like a chain reaction, with each step linking to the next in a continuous cascade. Szilard coined the term chain reaction for this phenomenon and even filed a patent. He also realized that if a controlled chain reaction could be achieved, the energy released during nuclear fission could be harnessed to create a superbomb. This superbomb, what we now call an atomic bomb, was a revolutionary weapon at the time. However, Szilard's concept of a chain reaction remained a theoretical model requiring experimental verification. This task was accomplished by several other physics luminaries of the time. In 1938, German scientist Hahn successfully conducted a nuclear fission experiment using uranium. Hahn's colleague, the female scientist Meitner, took this achievement to Sweden and shared it with another important figure, Niels Bohr. Bohr, a Nobel laureate in physics in 1922 and a close friend of Einstein, visited the United States for academic exchange in the spring of 1939 and discussed the latest findings on nuclear fission with Einstein and the Italian scientist Fermi. By this time, Szilard had also arrived in the United States and was teaching at Columbia University. These scientific giants gathered to explore the potential applications of nuclear fission. It's important to note that scientists like Szilard and Einstein were not engaged in quiet laboratory studies of abstract theories. By 1939, the shadow of World War II had already cast itself over Europe, and Germany's invasion of Western Europe was imminent. In the United States, individuals like Szilard, Einstein, and Fermi were Jewish refugees, deeply concerned about the prospect of Nazi Germany conquering Europe and potentially invading the United States ushering in a dark era. To prevent this dire scenario, these scientists were determined to unite and thwart Germany's access to cutting-edge military technology. The fundamental theory of the atomic bomb wasn't a secret at the time. Nuclear fission had been initially discovered by German scientists. If Germany managed to develop a powerful atomic bomb before the United States, even with its considerable resources, the U.S. might have faced defeat. Recognizing this, 
Szilard proposed that Einstein write a letter to President Roosevelt, outlining the significance of the atomic bomb as a weapon. On August 2, 1939, Szilard, accompanied by his close friend and another Jewish physicist, Wigner, arrived at Einstein's residence. The three of them collaborated to draft a letter addressed to President Roosevelt. As Szilard didn't know how to drive, he enlisted a young man to serve as his driver. This young man would later become the father of the hydrogen bomb, Teller. In the letter to the president, Szilard and Einstein vehemently emphasized that if Germany were to develop an atomic bomb first, a single bomb could devastate an entire major U.S. city. To prevent this nightmare scenario, it was essential for the U.S. government to marshal the collective strength of the scientific community and proactively engage in atomic bomb development. However, either Einstein nor Szilard had a direct connection to President Roosevelt. Szilard turned to his friend Sachs, an economic advisor to Roosevelt, who was willing to act as an intermediary for this important message. Sachs' delivery of the letter to Roosevelt later became a legendary episode in the history of science. Initially, Roosevelt was resistant to the lengthy letter filled with complex physics terminology. However, Sachs recounted a story to him. In the early 19th century, an American named Fulton invented the first steamboat. He presented this invention to the French Emperor Napoleon, hoping to persuade Napoleon to use this innovative vessel for an attack on England. Yet, Napoleon remained indifferent to Fulton's invention and eventually paid the price by losing to the British in a naval battle. Sachs informed Roosevelt that the atomic bomb was the 20th century equivalent of the steamboat, and the United States must not repeat Napoleon's mistake. Hearing this analogy, Roosevelt was deeply moved. He promptly replied to Einstein, stating that he would establish a uranium advisory committee to specifically research the atomic bomb. However, at that time, the United States had not yet formally entered World War II. The progress in establishing the Uranium Advisory Committee by the U.S. government was quite slow and wasn't officially established until December 1941. Before that, research in the U.S. physics community on nuclear matters was mostly independent, with Szilard being a central figure. In the spring of 1940, Szilard secured a $6,000 sponsorship from the U.S. Army and Navy through personal connections. This funding helped Fermi construct the United States' first small-scale nuclear reactor at Columbia University. By the end of 1941, this reactor was relocated to the University of Chicago and placed beneath a tennis court in a stadium. On December 2, 1942, Fermi's reactor achieved the first controlled sustained nuclear fission in human history marking a milestone in the history of nuclear physics. In the early stages of the development of the U.S. atomic bomb, Szilard undertook a crucial role in intellectual management. Many scientists from Europe were involved in the project, such as Fermi and Wigner. While immensely talented, they were unfamiliar with the U.S. academic and governmental systems. Szilard served as a bridge between these scientists and the U.S. government, securing extensive financial and material assistance for their research. He also assumed the position of chief scientist at the University of Chicago's Nuclear Reactor Laboratory, providing substantial professional guidance to Fermi's experiments. At the time, Szilard had a nickname, Bull Leach. Colleagues joked that only when he raised the most pointed questions, others wouldn't take offense. Without Szilard, often referred to as the king of networking, the development of U.S. nuclear weapons would likely have taken much longer. Of course, the resources invested by the U.S. government itself and the engineering management were equally indispensable to the nuclear weapons project. In June 1942, President Roosevelt officially approved the plan to develop the first atomic bomb and entrusted the project to the Army Corps of Engineers. The office of the Corps of Engineers was located in Manhattan, New York, hence the internal codename for the Atomic Bomb Project, the Manhattan Project. The individual tasked by the U.S. Army to oversee the Manhattan Project was General Leslie Groves, the builder of the Pentagon. The initial task of the Manhattan Project was to produce the nuclear materials required for the atomic bomb warhead. At that time, the material used by the United States was uranium. However, uranium metal itself did not easily undergo fission reactions. It was a specific isotope contained within it, uranium-235, 
that played a crucial role. This isotope constituted only 0.7% of natural uranium and required extraction and enrichment. Additionally, there was another isotope in uranium or uranium-238. This isotope could be converted through nuclear reactors into another substance, plutonium, which could also serve as the core of an atomic bomb. To cover all bases, the Manhattan Project adopted a dual-track strategy. Groves found 60,000 acres of barren land in Tennessee and constructed an immense facility for uranium-235 extraction later known as the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Simultaneously, a new reactor was built in Hanford, Washington, specifically for plutonium production. Today, this site is the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Once the construction of the nuclear materials factory was initiated, the design work for the atomic bomb itself also commenced in full swing. Scientists were brought to the remote region of Los Alamos, New Mexico, where a canyon by the same name provided isolation from the outside world. From January 1943 to the summer of 1945, they would spend a total of two and a half years secluded in this canyon, forbidden from communicating with the outside. To accommodate the needs of these scientists, Grove's engineers built an entirely new city in Los Alamos spanning 18,500 hectares. This city included laboratories, residences, and stores, although each residence lacked a house number. In U.S. government records, this city is referred to as Site Y, and its overall leader was the renowned J. Robert Oppenheimer. Each scientist who entered Site Y adopted an alias. Fermi went by Mr. Farmer, and 1927 Nobel laureate Compton became Mr. Constock. By the end of 1943, a new, thick-eyebrowed guest took up residence at Los Alamos. Within Site Y, he was known as Uncle Nick but his true identity was that of Einstein's old friend, the Danish physicist Niels Bohr. Bohr's involvement in atomic bomb research epitomizes the successful implementation of engineering management by the U.S. government. Although Bohr had visited the United States in 1939, he quickly returned to his homeland of Denmark, where he became trapped by the invading German forces. It wasn't until 1943 that he was rescued by the Allies and flown to England. At that time, the UK also had an independent atomic bomb research program and sought to enlist Bohr's expertise. However, due to financial constraints, the British government could not provide sufficient research funding. It was during this juncture that the United States extended a helping hand. Not only did they open the Manhattan Project to allow British scientists to participate, but they also volunteered to share the final research results. It was against this backdrop that Bohr went from the UK to the United States. Through this year's UK collaboration, the United States also gained insight into the latest developments in British nuclear physics. It can be said that the entire Manhattan Project was a large-scale international endeavor funded by the US government. So, how much money did the United States spend to develop the first atomic bomb? Let's calculate. The entire Manhattan Project received a total of $1.89 billion in financial appropriations, equivalent to $22.8 billion today. At its peak, the project employed directly or indirectly half a million people, with just the Oak Ridge and Hanford facilities employing 120,000 workers. To organize such a massive workforce within the entire project, ensuring there were no safety incidents or leaks, is a testament to the management capabilities of the U.S. scientific and military departments. In this context, the role of Oppenheimer is particularly noteworthy. Author Richard Rhodes observed that Oppenheimer wasn't confined to an office, pointing fingers at documents. He would be present at every significant meeting, tracking each crucial discovery, ensuring that every scientist felt their work contributed to the entire project. In the case of this superproject, which brought together some of the world's most brilliant minds, this was of paramount significance. Under such efficient organization, the United States successfully conducted the first atomic bomb test on July 16, 1945. This achievement came just three years after the formal initiation of the Manhattan Project. On August 6 and 9, 1945, two atomic bombs were dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. 
one of the most devastating weapons in human history played a significant role in hastening the end of World War II. Part 2. All right, the above details the process outlined in the making of the atomic bomb, where the United States successfully created the first atomic bomb through intellectual and engineering management. At this point, you may have some questions. In the letter that Einstein and Szilard wrote to President Roosevelt in 1939, Weren't they particularly concerned about Germany developing the atomic bomb first? Why did the United States manage to overtake Germany in the development of the atomic bomb, despite Germany being the leading technological power in Europe at the time? It's important to note that in the early development of nuclear physics, German scientists played a pivotal role. Both Einstein, who discovered the principle of mass-energy equivalence, and Hahn, who discovered nuclear fission, were born in Germany. As mentioned earlier, figures like Szilard, Wigner, and Teller either conducted academic research at German universities for an extended period or held German citizenship. Author Richard Rhodes paints an image. Prior to 1933, the lingua franca of the European scientific community was German. More than half of the most important original work in nuclear physics was conducted in Germany. However, the situation changed with Hitler's rise to power. The Nazi regime implemented cruel policies that persecuted Jewish intellectuals, even within the scientific community. Figures like Einstein and Szilard chose to leave their homeland for this reason. The anti-Semitic wave in Germany also affected another fascist country, Italy. Italian Nobel laureates Fermi and Segre, for example, fled to the United States in 1938. In other words, before the outbreak of World War II, these two Axis powers had already lost a significant number of top nuclear physicists. Don't underestimate the impact of this brain drain. From 1935 to 1938, over 300 professor-level natural scientists immigrated from Germany to the United States alone. With these scholars gone, Germany's ability to engage in intellectual management within the realm of physics vanished. The laboratories and equipment remained, but the key research leaders were absent and each specialized field saw experts departing. This left Germany's nuclear physics community full of gaps. To illustrate, nuclear reactors are crucial tools for studying fission phenomena and producing weapons-grade plutonium, often utilizing graphite as a moderator. However, many of Germany's graphite research experts had emigrated prior to the war leaving the remaining scientists in the lab with a pile of erroneous data that led them to believe graphite's moderating effect was subpar. As a result, Germany's development of nuclear reactors initially opted for the slower production method of artificially creating heavy water as a moderator. Just this issue alone caused a two-year delay in Germany's nuclear technology development. To make matters worse, a significant portion of the Jewish physicists who left Germany and Italy went to the United States. After the United States declared war on Germany at the end of 1941, many of these top scientists joined the Manhattan Project, contributing their expertise to develop weapons to defeat Germany. This back-and-forth migration between Germany and the United States exacerbated Germany's situation. Additionally, the aggressive nature of the Nazi regime's actions stirred neutral scientists in other European countries. For example, initially, Bohr chose to remain in Denmark, avoiding collaboration with Germany as well as aiding the United States. However, in 1941, German nuclear physicists approached Bohr, boasting about the achievements of Nazi military technology with an air of arrogance. This condescending attitude infuriated Bohr. In 1943, he decided to go to the United States, driven in part by his aversion to Germany. However, Bohr himself was not a persecuted Jew. Nevertheless, even with the loss of intellectual management, Germany's nuclear weapons development started earlier than that of the United States. On September 1, 1939, the very first day of World War II, the German Army Ordnance Office held a national conference of nuclear physicists. They decided to assign the task of developing nuclear weapons to the Berlin Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Physics with 1932 Nobel laureate Heisenberg leading the project. However, Heisenberg's project management capabilities were far inferior to those of Szilard and Oppenheimer in the United States. He immediately made two fatal mistakes. 
First, Germany's nuclear weapons project was never effectively integrated. Its nine project groups were scattered across nine different universities, some responsible for researching nuclear fission and others for producing heavy water, with inadequate information sharing among them. Consequently, the entire project became chaotic, and progress was impossible to align. Heisenberg himself was a risk-averse manager. He feared that setting a timetable might lead to blame from the military if the task was not completed on time. Thus, he opted to extend the timeline significantly, stating that it would take five years to develop an atomic bomb. It's important to note that Germany's top weapon projects were under the direct control of Hitler, who was very impatient. Upon hearing that the development of nuclear weapons would take so long, he immediately lost interest, and Heisenberg could no longer expect sufficient funding and manpower. In addition to the project management errors, Germany's nuclear weapons program had another significant flaw, a lack of clear objectives. Heisenberg himself was not a proponent of atomic bombs. He had a biased belief that the most crucial military potential of nuclear physics was to develop small reactors for installation on naval ships and submarines, rather than producing atomic bombs. Due to this bias, Germany's nuclear project's technology tree veered off course. All research groups were focused on testing how to stabilize nuclear reactors and laboratories, without prioritizing the more immediately impactful atomic bomb. Germany's initial advantage in nuclear technology was thus squandered needlessly. Unfortunately, Heisenberg was also an arrogant scientist. In February 1942, the German Army Ordnance Office organized a scientific conference, inviting high-ranking Nazi officials like Goebbels and Himmler and arranged for Heisenberg to deliver a keynote speech. The intention was to emphasize the importance of the nuclear project and secure more funding from these officials. However, Heisenberg prepared an extremely technical presentation filled with various physics terms, leaving the high-ranking officials baffled. Germany's Minister of Armaments, Speer, was so disappointed with Heisenberg's performance that he downgraded the priority of the nuclear project to the lowest level. This made an already challenging situation even more difficult. Throughout World War II, Germany allocated a total of 8 million Reichsmarks for nuclear technology research, equivalent to 2 million US dollars. This funding was only 1 slash 1,000 of the total investment in the Manhattan Project. With such limited funding, Germany's intellectual and project management turned into a complete mess. As a result, they not only failed to produce an atomic bomb but also faced numerous malfunctions in the assembly of the three nuclear reactors they managed to put together, rendering them unable to sustain operation. In May 1945, a U.S. Army intelligence team located Heisenberg and his team in southern Germany and detained them in Britain. It wasn't until then that Heisenberg still believed that his research progress was ahead of that of the United States. On August 7, 1945, News of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima reached Britain. Heisenberg's initial reaction was to tell his colleagues, that must be a chemical bomb. How could the Americans possibly develop a uranium-based super bomb before us Germans? To be fair, Heisenberg's contributions to nuclear physics are undeniable. After World War II, he successfully designed a sophisticated experimental reactor in Munich and later oversaw the planning of West Germany's first nuclear power plant. These achievements suggest that he was capable of managing complex projects under favorable external conditions. However, during World War II, the German nuclear weapons project under his leadership turned out to be a complete failure. This was primarily due to the unjust nature of the Nazi regime which extended racial ideology into scientific research, resulting in the breakdown of intellectual management. Heisenberg's arrogance and bias further paralyzed project management. Nevertheless, we should also be grateful that the immensely destructive weapon of the atomic bomb did not originate in Nazi Germany. Otherwise, humanity would have faced even more prolonged struggles and paid a much heavier price to win the fight against fascism. Aside from Nazi Germany, Another fascist country, Japan, also attempted to develop nuclear weapons during World War II. Compared to Germany, Japan's foundation in nuclear physics was much weaker, but they had several prominent scientists. For instance, Einstein's student Yoshio Nishino was a professor at Kyoto University. 
There was also a scholar, Yoshio Nakanishi, who had been a research partner of Bohr. In May 1941, the Japanese government officially launched a project to research atomic bombs, starting much earlier than the U.S. Manhattan Project. However, Japan had a unique systemic flaw, deep-seated conflicts between its army and navy, engaged in prolonged power struggles. In their competition for influence over the nuclear project, both the Japanese army and navy established separate teams for nuclear weapons development, led by Yoshio Nishina and Yoshio Nakanishi respectively, and they blocked information from each other. Consequently, progress on both projects was sluggish. Neither team managed to create nuclear reactors nor produce a sufficient amount of enriched uranium. By the spring of 1945, Japan's mainland was already under the shadow of strategic bombing by the U.S. military, and most nuclear physics laboratories had been completely destroyed. Despite this, the Japanese military remained confident and demanded that Yoshio Nakanishi produce an atomic bomb within a year. When news of the bombing of Hiroshima on August 6 reached Japan, Yoshio Nakanishi was urgently dispatched to the site for an on-site investigation. His conclusion was that the United States had successfully developed atomic bombs in Japan, even with its best efforts, could not catch up in the short term. In this multinational race towards the atomic bomb, the ultimate victor was the United States, due to its superior ability in intellectual and project management. Now I've provided you with the main content from Raza's book The Secret History of the Atomic Bomb. As the first ever large-scale scientific project led by a nation in human history, the success of the Manhattan Project remains a classic case study in management. The $1.89 billion invested by the U.S. government, which would only have covered nine days of military spending during World War II, yielded four functional atomic bombs, three national laboratories, and thousands of scientific patents. It could be considered one of the highest returns on investment in military history. This is one of the key reasons why Fortune magazine included the secret history of the atomic bomb in its list of must-read business books. In this context, the experiences of American scientists and government officials in implementing intellectual and project management can serve as examples for ordinary individuals like us. Figures like Vannevar Bush, who played a pivotal role in connecting different departments and maintaining the flow of information, addressing issues, and meeting demands in a timely manner, are essential skills needed in any company or team. On the other hand, the determination of top decision-makers like Roosevelt, the execution abilities of figures like Groves, coupled with the active involvement of department heads like Oppenheimer, form an indispensable trinity in any successful business project. This is one of the valuable lessons that Raza's book The Secret History of the Atomic Bomb imparts to us. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.